Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Today is an exciting day, a historic day, a very big day because we're doing our first ever author interview and I'm very excited to kick it off with Derek Owusu. Derek is not only the author of That Reminds Me, but also Losing the Plot. He was also most recently named one of Grant Dad's best and the brightest, hottest, coolest British authors in the biz. Derek, thank you so much for coming onto my channel. I'd like to start by asking you, how does it feel to be one of Britain's sexiest authors? <laughs> what, what, okay. I wasn't expecting that kind of question. Um, I, 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 I didn't know that was the case. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, you know, I mean, obviously you're talking about the Grana thing and I think that yeah. um, it's really, um, it's really interesting. You know, I have severe imposter syndrome about it, which I'm kind of glad about. I think if you let these things go to your head, then it affects your writing and it affects, it affects your personality, which I don't want it to do. So I'm still kind of just like, I can't believe this is happening sort of thing. And just getting yeah. on with it really, yeah. I think that's probably the best way to be. Um, considering that summer is just around the corner, are there any hot salacious fun reads that are on your radar um well i've just finished michael mcgee's close to home oh, yeah. which is amazing like it's, it's it's a really incredible book it's amazing storytelling and just the, the, the subtleties in how he's um depicting life in belfast is is it's it's pretty in, in, incredible so i've just finished that i know that one of the hot Books of the summer is going to be the list by Yomi Adegoke. I've mm -hmm. seen a lot of people talking about that, and I've read that. That's really interesting. I think that's going to spark a lot of debate. Um, very, very interesting book. Um, um, the Three of Us by Ore Agbaji Williams as well. Mm -hmm. It's another really good one. That I think it's going to be it's going to be quite hot this summer. Um, Mrs. I mean, I think those three. Oh, Mrs. Oh, S. You said Mrs. S by Kate Patrick. Um, oh yeah, I, I really want to read that. Yeah, I think that's going to be really big this summer as well. Cool. Well, thank you so much for indulging me with those questions. Um, I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about your novels. Both Losing the Plot and That Reminds Me explore themes of family and relationships. What draws you to explore the family unit in your work? I think that the family is our entrance to the world. You know, that's how we learn what the world is, and that's we get our ideas about the world from our families. So it seems that that is that has to be the key in order for us to enter the world. Um, I think majority, I think every novel I've ever read is usually about family in one way or another. A lack, a lack of family, or interaction with family, or trying to understand what is family in terms of place, in terms of people, environment, and those kind of things. So it always just comes to the comes to the surface in 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 whatever I'm writing, um, and I think also because you know I write quite autobiographically as well, mm -hmm. and family is something that I've always been really thinking about trying to understand in my own life. So it, it does come into my writing quite a lot. Definitely, and then I realized that in losing the plot, the narrator's mother is an outsider to London, and we, the reader are experiencing her story through the lens of her son. Just as the son can never truly know his mother, we, the reader, can never know the mother. Mm. Um, what was the impetus for telling the story that way? Did you ever consider you know, telling the story through the mother's point of view? I did, but I felt like that would be dishonest in, in what it was I was trying to convey, the experience I was trying to convey. You know, I could have, yeah, I could have just written a straight narrative mm -hmm explaining this person's life but that's just not how we how i believe a lot of young immigrant parent uh, young immigrant children get it from their parents they get it in these kind of vague yeah things that they their parents will say and we have to try and figure out what it is they mean and so on and so forth because they're not really forthcoming with the information because i don't think it's none of our business um yeah. <laughs> but you know um but we want to know these things so yeah so that's how it came out and i knew that that's that's how i had to write it it had to be written in that particular style, which is fine for me because my general writing style leans more towards the kind of um, oblique and abstract. And I think that, that that was the best way for me to kind of convey 
what it was I was trying to do. Yeah, that definitely makes sense to me, especially um, I'm a child of immigrants too. My mother was born in England and then my father was born in India. I was born in America. So whenever they speak of their like childhood or their experiences, it's very much so how it is at, like at the very end of losing the plot where the narrator's interviewing his mother and he's asking those questions and she's kind of just like, like, why are you asking me this? Like, sure, maybe I was sad, like who knows? Um, so kind of going off of that, on page 107, you had this one line that really haunted me. An immigrant mother who will die here alone and can only rise with the body of her work her son has done well. Um, I thought that really like stayed with me the longest. And would you mind unpacking that for us a little bit? I can also share the line before that, if that helps. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just kind of, a, you know, a brutal understanding of what it is a lot of our immigrant parents have done is that they've brought us here to this country, try to make sure that we assimilate and ingratiate, ingratiate ourselves with, with people here. And that also means adopting the cultural norms here as well, the cultural yeah. attitudes towards life and death and what to do with our parents. You know, so back in Ghana, the idea of putting a parent into an old per a person's mm -hmm. home really frowned upon. Yeah. It's kind of like, what are you doing? You're, you're, you, it's now your turn to look after your parents. That's more complicated for immigrant children like myself because although that's our culture, our adopted culture is at the forefront of how we think. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just different here. The, your lives are different. You're not really living with family as in the way that you, yeah. my mother would have back, back home. So there'll be more of a family unit in order to take care of these kind of things. Um, and so I was, and I was really, there's a little bit of an autobiographical note in there that the only way that I can really overcome or we can overcome that is to really make something of ourselves in, in this country, mm -hmm. um, which, I mean, considering what London's like at the moment, it's very, very difficult. Yeah. No, definitely. I totally hear that. And going to speak a little bit about your writing style, you are very lyrical, but you're also colloquial, as we see in the footnotes of losing the plot, and you even throw in some twee into your novel. How did you develop this prose style? What were the influences that shaped your voice? I think the influences that shaped me writing in kind of like English that I just was hearing off road, you know, growing up in Tottenham yeah. and one was probably an author called Robin Travis who wrote a book called Mama Can't Raise No Man. Mm -hmm. And before I read that book, I hadn't really seen kind of like Tottenham slang or like London slang in a novel before. Cause I just thought we weren't allowed to do that. I thought no one's doing that, no one wants to hear that. And he did it and he done it so well. I think one thing with, with slang as well is that it's really hard to get it right and yeah. make and have it not sound corny and just mm -hmm. stupid. Um, because it, it, that's that's very easy to do. You can really get it wrong. I, I, think, I feel like a lot of authors get it wrong. Um, so that was one influence. In terms of my just general writing style, I wouldn't be able to pin down one influence because I think because I, I read so much and it just really kind of just seeped into me. And But just kind of polit, um, particular writing styles like authors like Jose Saramago and F. Scott Fitzgerald and people like uh, people like that, their style really got to me in terms that I never really wanted to write. Just like kind of straightforwardly, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I don't really like exposition too much when I'm writing. I like to just draw pictures and allow the reader to kind of see what I'm trying to draw or convey emotions and see if they can pick up what it is that I'm trying to convey with, with these words. It's an impossible task, you know. It's like you know, I mean essentially it's essentially poetry. It's an impossible task, but it's the the attempt that I think people really understand, you know, and with poetry you feel it before you understand it. And mm -hmm. that's how I that's how I feel about my own writing as well. That's a really lovely way to look at it. Um going back in time a little bit, when did you realize you were a writer? I never did. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because you know, a lot of people and 
Yeah, a lot of people will say, you know, I've wanted to be a writer for this amount of time and it's always been my dream and whatnot. I can't say that. You know, it's not true. Um, I never always wanted to be a writer. I never really knew what I wanted to, to be. I do feel like that writing is my calling, but I just never knew mm. that. You know? um, so when I realised that I was going to take this seriously was after I'd finished writing That Reminds Me and I was with an editor who had the book hadn't been picked up yet and we were just talking and he was talking about me publishing something with him and he was talking really seriously and then I thought and I had a moment where I thought oh is this actually going to be a serious thing for me like writing yeah um yeah but no I was never really I mean that's why I don't take myself seriously at all um <laughs> so yeah no it was never a dream but I do feel like it's my calling if you weren't writing would there were you like pursuing other career paths at the time like what were you thinking of what was going on in your head i was just trying to just keep a job to be honest i just wanted to have a job have money coming yeah. in um i've never really been that kind of aspirational person you know i mean i used to be a personal trainer and i, I loved the gym and i loved working mm -hmm. in the gym and that was a great job i managed a few gyms so i probably would have just carried on managing gyms and maybe one day try to open my own or something like that but again i didn't feel like that was something i really thought one day I want to do this. No, I'm not really aspirational in that way. Yeah, just one day at a time. Just one day at a time, exactly. <laughs> cool. And then do you have a daily writing practice? What does a typical writing day look like? Or do you have any writing rit rituals? No, but when I have, when the idea for a book comes to me and it's ready to be written, I just become completely obsessed with it. So I'll write mm. any moment, anywhere I am and something comes to me, I'll write, I'll write, I'll write. I become really consumed with it. I can never have like a schedule because if I sit down to write, I won't do it. It mm. has to, it just has to feel like this organic um, moment, it's in the organic computers to make me, to make me want to do it. Um, I wish I did though. I mean, I would get so much more work done if I actually had a schedule. <laughs> I woke up every morning at five and did a thousand words and then, yeah. But I don't feel like my writing would be the way it is because I work so much off, off, off emotion. Mm -hmm. At five o'clock in the, in the morning, my emotions aren't the way that they would be at like in the afternoon when I've experienced a, th a few things. So I need the day to begin in order for my body to start working before I can even write anything. Definitely. That makes sense. So would you say that once an idea comes for you, to you, you're very much so obsessed and you really focus your time on it is it to the extent that you're like not hanging out with anyone and you're really in it or yeah no i'm not seeing anyone i'm just it's in my head so i'm just stuck mm -hmm. in it yeah um even if i'm around someone and they're talking to me i'm thinking about polishing the last sentence that i wrote before i saw them i, I just can't do anything else but think about it yeah definitely that makes sense um what do people not notice in your work that you wish they would focus on more? That's a good question. No one's ever asked me that before. Um, <laughs> it's a hard know, question. Maybe, 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 the, maybe the inside jokes, that, but I guess, I mean, the inside jokes for a reason. I guess no one's really going to pick up on them. But yeah, I, I put a lot of jokes in there. I always put a reference to Eddie Murphy's coming to America in every single thing that I write, even like short stories. And I tried to put in articles as well. Um, no, 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 nothing really. You know, I mean, people take what they take, they get what they get. As long mm -hmm. as they're taking something, I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that. Cool. Yeah. That sounds good. Um, switching gears to reading. What's your relationship like to reading growing up? Did you turn to books often? I know you do seem like you read a decent amount. So I'd love to know a little more. Yeah, I read quite a bit. I never used to read. I hated school when I was younger. Um, I got kicked out of about three colleges. I just didn't like it. Um, mm -hmm. I never read a book cover to cover until I was 24. When I went to university, I went to university when I was 24. Um, and I was just blown away by it. I didn't know what it was like to read a novel. I didn't know what a novel was. I didn't know the difference between, you know, books. Um, but I started reading D.H. Lawrence and I was, became mm. obsessed. I was just like, wow, this is amazing. The, the words, the feeling, the, 
just everything about it just felt like this real it's spiritual thing it sounds silly but it really felt like this really esoteric moment for me and um and then from there i was just obsessed i just wanted to read anything i could get my hands on so i went through loads of different phases i went through kind of like a classics phase i didn't know they were classics though i was just reading the books I became obsessed with oscar wilde ian forster mm -hmm. gh lawrence of course then i went through a john green uh phase where I became obsessed with with, with his novels, um, Milan Kundera, Charles Bukowski, Haruki Murakami, still one of my favorite mm -hmm. authors. And I used to just yeah, go through phases. I'd find one author and just obsess over them, read everything they've written. Um, it's not really like that now. Um, now I just kind of, you know, I open a book, if the first 10 pages, if the writing takes me, then I'll read it. I'm really big on writing style. If I can't mm -hmm. click, writing style I just will not read the book no matter how good the story is it just won't work for me yeah. I have to I really have to feel the writing is is it's hard to explain you just you just know it when you know it you know mm -hmm. it's a really hard thing to explain you just don't click with all books like that so um and I will never force myself to read a finish a book I'm not enjoying ever really no I used to do that and I just thought why am I doing this what's what is the point here um so no, I can't do it not anymore. I force myself, well, not all the time, but I like to finish a book through if I'm not enjoying it because I want to see why is it not working for me. Like I want to understand what the author's trying to do. And sometimes I'm kind of like, okay, if I had written this, like how would I have made it so that I enjoy it? I kind of think of it like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I, I, I mean, I do get you. Um... And I mean, a lot of people have told me they, they've started, but just put my book down because they won't enjoy it. And in my head, I'm just kind of like, you know what, fair play. Sometimes it can feel like it's, it's hard work, you know? And mm -hmm. with some books, you know, there's many books where I've started reading it, put it down, been like, this is not for me. Picked it up months later and it's just clicked. Yeah. And suddenly I'm like, wow, why didn't I like this the first time I started reading? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It, sometimes it's just about your mood, where you mm -hmm. are going on those kind of things you know your your, your headspace um but i think yeah i think forcing myself to read a book it just feels like i could just be doing something else or i can just come definitely. back i can just come back yeah. to this later it might, it might click with me then you know definitely that makes sense um when you're in the process of writing a novel are you actively reading or would you say that sometimes you need a deep process of reading before you then go into writing yeah i can't read fiction or poetry while i'm writing mm -hmm. i read non-fiction though it helps stimulate yeah. my mind a lot um get the ideas going but i can't read just because i'm so worried about sleep, like accidentally stealing somebody else's style mm. accidentally mimicking something they've done or picking up a line that stuck with me and putting it yeah. into my i really worry about that so no i, I don't read any but before I say before. I never even know when before is when I start writing. So I can't. Yeah. <laughs> I can't really say that I read to prepare myself. No, I just make sure that I don't read fiction and poetry while I'm in the process. Of in writing. the act of writing. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, in 2020, you had an interview with The Guardian where you described The Great Gatsby as a comfort novel, but also the greatest novel ever written. <laughs> Would you still stay with that uh, title and? What from the gate what from the great Gatsby works for you? I would it it slips in and out of my top ten now. Okay. Um and yeah, no, what it what it is about the Great Gatsby is it's one the language. The language is, mm. is exquisite, it's amazing. Um Gatsby as a character was just so interesting to me because he's just so to me epitomized what it was like being a young working class boy in Tottenham. Mm -hmm. His aspirations, the the way he went about things, um, you know, um, you, you know, because so many people around my area would turn to like kind of like selling drugs, selling weed and stuff. Mm -hmm. Gatsby was a bootle bootlegger. He was essentially a drug dealer as well. Yeah. And Maya Wolfenstein, um, his mentor, there was so many guys like that in my area who would take a young person under their wing and get them doing those things 
Um, even his name wasn't even Gatsby, you know, and a lot of people around here would just take on, we call them tag names, where they just use a fake name and everyone calls them that, even though they know it's not yeah. their real name. Um, so a lot of that just kind of connected with me and I just thought, wow, this is, this is, you know, definitely not what F. Scott Fitzgerald intended, but I'm taking it like this anyway. Um, so it just really resonated with me. I, I think it mostly just the language, man. It was just so beautiful, uh, beautifully written sentences where I would just read them over and over and over again. Um, it was, yeah, it was such a great experience. Has, is, is it something that you've ever returned to? Because for me personally, I've reread The Great Gatsby like a couple of times now. Oh, yeah, I've read it a bunch of times. I used to read it, reread it every year. Oh, wow, sometimes, nice. Sometimes more than that, yeah. So, I mean, sometimes I just pick it up, flip to a random page and read a couple of pages and put it down as well. Yeah. And then you mentioned, because you mentioned this, I have to go there, um, a top 10 list. Are there any other novels that you really think about often? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. Mm -hmm. That's another one up there. Um, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou is up there. Go Tell It on the Mountain, James Baldwin is up there. Um, a book called The Terrible by Yersa Daly Ward. Mm -hmm. That's that's up there for me as well. Um, a new book, actually, a, a novel that came out, I think, last, maybe 2021, called The Coming Bad Days by Sarah Bernstein. She's on the grant mm -hmm. list as well. Yeah. That's immediately gone into my top 10 it's so good so it's i'm i'm unreal that book um yeah the do the double by jose sarama it's tra it's i mean i'm saying all this now tomorrow i'd say a complete <laughs> list. so yeah you know it just changes all the time i feel you i feel the same way um have you ever read native son by richard wright i have yeah yeah, yeah. um really really loved the first half Mm -hmm. in three parts i think i really loved the first part i had some issues with the way he was writing the sex scenes i thought that was so bad terrible it was so out of place yeah. um and i didn't like part three because it just felt like socialist propaganda which is fine you know mm -hmm. that's that's what he was trying to do at the time but it was just too over it was too much like oh my god i'm this person is trying to convince me of something right now and yeah. it's a novel I'm, I'm trying to enjoy myself not have a lecture um but other than that no i, I did like i think his other works are better i think his, other, his short stories are really mm -hmm. good yeah for sure but yeah yeah native son yeah it was okay it was all right yeah definitely so when you're writing a novel i know you mentioned that style is very important to you and are there any other qualities that you're hoping to inject into the novel or are you looking at plot character what after style what comes next for you character i think char character and style they're intertwined for me you mm -hmm. know depending on who i'm writing or the emotions person's feeling will dictate how i write it um but yeah no character and 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 writing style you know you know an emotion obviously that's part of the character as well but emotional intensity i really think about emotional intensity when i'm writing um plot i think i'm not too fast about but story comes from characters you can't mm -hmm. have a character without a story so if you're written if you've written a character well you have a story do you know what i mean it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be elaborate or or plotty it, you know it's just a story you know if yeah. i'm writing somebody i wrote a story about a woman who's just cleaning out her fridge that's the story you know, and where her mind goes and what she's doing mm -hmm. and all those things. I think if you write anything, even the mundane, if you write it well, people will enjoy it. Um, yeah. That's how I see it. But um, plots are overrated to me. I feel you. I agree. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So now that we've covered your novels, your reading and writing, um, what's next are you working on a new novel do you have ideas percolating can you tell us a little bit about what's what's on the radar for you yeah i mean i'm contractually obliged to write another novel <laughs> okay <laughs> um with uh, with with canon gate which i'll do that i mean the idea is it's in my head it's almost finished in my head it's just the middle part which is always a tricky part that i'm trying to solve and figure out what i want to do there but it's there, I can feel it, it's there. So mm. 
So would you say that, sorry, not to interrupt, but you're, you really think through this in your mind before you even go to the page. Like, is the whole story fleshed out in your brain? Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, no, it's, it, it always depends. So with losing the mm -hmm. plot, it wasn't really like that. It was just a, a burst of energy. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote the first quite, uh, quite a few of the first um, chapters. And then um, then it was more okay to thinking it through. With yeah. this, from the beginning, I'm thinking it through, making sure I know everything. So the story has to be done in my head, then I can mm -hmm. transfer it to the page. Um, that reminds me was 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 very similar. Everything I had to see everything before I could write it. I had to see it. So all. you're kind of like outlining it in your brain. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Cool. And so, okay, to go back, you uh, contractually have to write a novel. Do you mm. know themes? Can you tell us a little bit about it? Or yeah, yeah. So it's essentially about a. Um, a young Ghanaian boy who is dealing with his alcoholic father, mm -hmm. who is ex his father's, they're saying that he's experiencing psychosis because he thinks that he is a Nancy the spider, which is a spider deity from Ghana. Mm. He thinks that's who he is. Um, and it's me, I'm just trying to explore the, you know, the father-son relationship, but also the kind of, the way we treat different religions in different countries, what we call myth and then what we will call religion, mm. um, who gets to make that decision and why we'll believe one thing and not the other. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to explore a lot of things. I mean, I say these are the things, but then when I start writing, so many different things just come up anyway. Yeah. Uh, but that's the kind of, I guess, the, the scaffolding and a lot of it just takes place in kind of like a, uh, mental health institute where the son is coming to visit his father. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, still focusing on family, but rather than the mother, we'll be looking at father-son relationships. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Cool. Um, is there anyone, is there someone you think that everyone should be reading right now that they're not? That they're not Sarah Bernstein, probably. Um, she has readers, of course she does, but I don't yeah. think they're not enough people are reading her i think she is amazing um i the thing is i think everybody on the ground list is incredible i yeah. feel i feel so lucky to be part of this list um you know i know critics have had their things to say and whatnot but i think it's just air because they haven't read the books they haven't read all mm -hmm. of the books yeah. um and if if also i feel like if you're cramming books i think one problem now as well i think one reason why there seems to be this kind of anti, I want to call it anti-intellectualism, this this kind of aversion to any kind of books where there's a little bit of hard work involved, a little mm -hmm. bit of, um, not, I won't even call it struggle, just take your time, you have to take your time with the yeah. prose. There's a lot of people against that at the moment because I think the the idea is to get through as many books as you can in a year. Mm -hmm. So if it, if it takes a long time, I think people get annoyed. They're like, I could read, I could have read two books in this time, yeah. and then I would have met my target for the. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> That's what. Uh, or, or or being able to read it and then put it on TikTok is how I've read this is. Yeah, it's amazing and whatnot. You know. Um, Do you have an opinion on TikTok on book talk? I've never really. I've never. Um, I don't have TikTok, so. Okay. It's I probably think... best you don't. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, okay. Um, I know, I'm... never, like, I don't know. What's it like? What, what, goes, what goes on there? I don't know. Well, I've been, like, on TikTok since 2019. So I've really seen, like, I don't, I'm not, like, a TikTok creator. I'm just, I'm a bit, long time lurker. And okay. <laughs> things have really changed quite a bit. So that's fascinating to see. And I do see book talk related stuff. But though there are some really smart creators on there for sure, I would have to say it's very aesthetic and it's like book as object, like doesn't my book look so pretty next to this coffee? And it's just, it's not as critically engaging as I'd like. And because for the most part, I would say people's attention spans are kind of, you know, dwindling. You really have to deliver content very fast. And I think it's hard to really critically engage or discuss literature because it's so nuanced. And 
most videos are like one minute max three minutes maybe so i feel like right. things are lost right 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 okay i see i see i see oh it, interesting okay well i mean it, it seems to be doing a lot of great things for some authors oh, at the moment, definitely you know? yeah it's very yeah. interesting the role of like author in the social media age it is yeah it's really i've been thinking about this a lot because you know you almost have to commodify yourself mm -hmm. so there was um there was after the, the grant tell came out there was an article that said you know the kind of the celebrity author is dead there's no such thing as it anymore firstly i i didn't even know that was desirable in the first place <laughs> Um, I don't know anyone who reads a book thinking they're going to become, who writes a book thinking they're going to become a celebrity. Um, but also, yeah, in yeah, in this day and age, in order to become a, like a star, if you're an author, you have to commodify yourself in this mm -hmm. way where you become more important than your book. Mm -hmm. And why would you want to do that? I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you've intrigued me now. I kind of want to see what TikTok's all about now. Book talk, what, what people are saying on there. <laughs> you should definitely check it out. I think it's worth it. And who knows, like maybe there's there's a novel. We haven't had a good like TikTok related novel or internet related novel in my opinion. So maybe there's mm. stuff you can massage out there. Interesting. Um, okay. Oh, I was going to ask one more thing. Um, do your, because as you mentioned this idea of like the author as a bit of a commodity, is there ever pressure for you from like the publisher, or your agent, I don't know, like to be more active on social media? Is that something that people mention to you? No, but they, they have once told me to be less active on social media. <laughs> um, on on Twitter, on Twitter, especially. I mean, there was, I think maybe like last year, there was a time where whenever I get stressed out, I just tweet absolutely insane things. I don't <laughs> I don't do it anymore, but I used to. And I think they were like, Derek, you need to just, you know, read it in a bit and just calm down. And I was like, yeah, I, I agree. Um, but no, there's never any pressure to be like, why don't you get on TikTok or why don't you get on Bookstagram and try and, and I don't know, create like a profile for yourself on there. I'm just really uninterested in being anything other than a writer. A writer. Like, that's it. Like, that's all. That's all I want to be, to be honest with you. Um, it's great if, you know, my books find a larger readership and whatnot. Um, but from what I can tell about the books that have blown up on TikTok, my writing style would not appeal to mm. the people reading those books. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is absolutely fine, you know. But, yeah. Definitely. That makes sense. Okay. Thank you so much for... Thank coming on chatting with me this has been lovely i really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me um is there where can people find you if they want to um i am on instagram and i think my instagram is just derek owusu i think um, i think you're right <laughs> yeah yeah i'm off twitter for a bit so i won't talk about okay it. cool well thank you so much i really appreciate this thank you